Hey, this is Herman Simon. I am honorary chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners, the world's leading price consultancy. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Gian Otzos. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. So perhaps the show is taking our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, then they can inspire real change. Hey, listeners, it's now time to adapt in our fast-moving world. Hey, listeners, Dennis here, and welcome to today's episode. Great to have you here with us. I have a wonderful guest with me today. His name is Herman Simon. Uh, He is a world-renowned management thinker, consultant, pricing expert, entrepreneur, and leading authority on Hidden Champions business model. He is the founder and honorary chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners, the world's leading price consultancy with over 1,700 employees and 42 offices worldwide. Simon is also the author of 40 books in 30 different languages, including the worldwide bestseller, Hidden Champions. Uh, Herman, a massive welcome to you. Hi, Dennis. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Excellent. Now, what I normally ask my guests is, whereabouts in the world are you today? I am in Bonn, Germany, the former capital of Western Germany, and uh, we are in a wonderful region here with the Rhine, Hills, uh, wineries. Uh, the weather is, is mixed, but uh, the trees are starting to blossom, so it's yeah. the best time of the year here. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. So Europe going into it is in spring, and it's beautiful, and um, yeah, the Rhine River area, just beautiful place to be um, so, yeah, very lucky, very fortunate indeed to be there. Now, Herman, I've given a little bit of an introduction to your background. Tell me, is there anything else you'd like to share about your background? I grew up in a small village on a farm. And that was in the 50s. Uh, it was like the Middle Ages. So we had no uh, machines on our farm, all was manual labor. But I still have a very good memory of, of that time. Then I, I studied uh, in my first life. I was a professor for 15 years. And then I founded a consulting company, which you mentioned, Simon Kutcher and Partners, and led that company for the next 15 years. So that is basically my career. Another important uh, period was my time in the Air Force. Originally, I wanted to become a starfighter pilot, which was the uh, fighter plane of the German Air Force in the Cold War, but I failed due to eye weakness. Still, I joined the Air Force, and that was important uh, as an experience as a young leader. I will come back to that. Very good. And I see that um, uh, Simon Kusher and Partners, that the organization, uh, sort of the main area, is, is probably, it sort of focuses on several areas, but one of them is around pricing consultancy. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, we are the global leader in price consulting with uh, 700 people, uh, as you mentioned. And uh, pricing, price theory, price management was my research topic during my time as a professor. And I always had the ambition to apply uh, the insights, the models, not just to develop uh, theory. And so we founded the company. We were the innovators, the pioneer in this field. And uh, this is the foundation for our global market leadership today. Yeah. And um, you and I were having a little bit of a chat. Now, we're not going to say what the number is, but I just think that you and I, both in our ages and our careers, 
both have left the corporate world uh, to go and start our own businesses very late in our corporate in our corporate life. What was that transition for you like? I once had a discussion with my wife. My wife was a teacher, also a tenured for life, and I was a life tenured professor. We both gave up our secure jobs and founded companies. My wife founded a company in the media sector, I in consulting. And we were asking ourselves, why did we do that? Nobody understood that. We both come from self-employed parents. My father, an independent free uh, farmer, and uh, my wife's uh, father had a, a little factory. And the answer was, we did not want to have a boss above us. If you do not want to have a boss above you, you must become a leader. You must stand on your own feet. I think that is the ultimate motivation why I became a leader. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's... Um... Uh, but we've been both of us have been in leadership roles, of course, in the corporate world. But then to go and stand on your own two feet as well, and to defend for yourself, go and build businesses while also employing others, bringing people into our team. Uh, that's just really great leadership, and I just think it's a wonderful thing too. So that's that's pretty exciting. Now, my question for you here, Herman, is um, how did you get into leadership? It started actually in the small village. Um, mm. In our neighborhood, we have uh, we had a gang of uh, six boys about my age, but I, I was the, the oldest and the tallest, and I was the natural leader of this gang. The second stage of, of leadership development was during my time in the Air Force. That was at the heat of the Cold War, partially comparable to, to what we experience today in Europe. Uh, in 1968, the Russians marched into Czechoslovakia. So there was an invasion of the Russians into Czechoslovakia. And I was in a, a bomber wing of the German Air Force, which had only one mission, to drop nuclear bombs on certain targets on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And we had permanent NATO alarms. I have seen the nuclear bomb many, many times. And they were very difficult situations. And I was a young uh, officer on duty and had to cope with these situations. This is an, an experience which uh, a normal person in private life uh, yeah, cannot experience. And the third phase of learning leadership was during my um, study times um, when I was a student representative and gave speeches in front of 100 students uh, that was after 68, it was turmoil, the student uprising in Paris, etc. So I think these were three formative periods for my own leadership capabilities. Mm. Yeah, and starting at a very young age with a gang of six, as you called it, right? I mean, it's wonderful to hear. Yeah, you you learn it as a as a, as a child yeah. in, in the sports team, as a in the scouts group or whatever the group is you are dealing with. Mm. Yeah, interesting how that all is um, and how that all works. Wow. Now, tell me, um, this person can be from history or can be alive. Who's your favorite leader and why? I do not have one favorite leader, but I would name three. Hmm. Uh, Marvin Bauer, the founder of McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey himself, he died three years after the company he was founded in 1932. And Marvin Bauer is the person who created McKinsey, the culture, uh, the, the spirit, etc. The second is uh, Joseph Cardinal Höfner, who was uh, one of the most influential figures uh, in the Catholic Church, a uh, cardinal in, in Cologne. And the third person is Mickey Lee. She is a granddaughter of the founder of Samsung, and she founded her own company, CJ Group, which now has a revenue of $26 billion. I met these three persons and they left a very strong impression on me. But I would also describe a group of leaders as, as role models. These are the leaders of the hidden champions. The hidden champions are mid-sized, unknown global market leaders. And uh, I have written a couple of books about them. The newest one is coming out in May, Hidden Champions in the Chinese Century. 
And these leaders, often founders, they deeply impressed me. And uh, they, they're characterized by certain traits which, which are somewhat unique. First, the unity of person and purpose, a total identification with what they do. Second, their ambition to be the best in their market. That's why they are world market leaders. Then focus, or you could call it single-mindedness. Only focus leads to world class. And fourth, the ability to inspire others. As, an, as a leader, you cannot do it alone. Uh, uh, an artist, a painter, uh, an author can become world famous on his or her own, not a leader or an entrepreneur. And this ability to inspire others, I, I, I uh, take that back to St. Augustine of Hippo, he said, the fire which burns in you, you must ignite in others. So this is my the, the world of the leaders who deeply impressed me. I also met many famous leaders. I met uh, Bill Clinton, I met M Mikhail uh, Gorbachev and uh, hundreds of, of leaders of large corporations. They impressed me much less than the people I just described. Hmm, hmm. Interesting, isn't it? So we've got world leaders and so forth, but those who really impressed you were the ones who were the hidden champions. And I love the different areas you talked about, unity of purpose, the ambition to be the best in their own market, um, and then what they do in their industry and so forth. Focus, which leads on to world class, and of course the ability to inspire others. That's that's brilliant. I think that's uh, that's wonderful attributes or things for them to have. But you actually you you took that from that, which is really great. And um, yeah, I, I love that. Um, I was going to say to you a question, which was if you had a chance to meet them. What would be a question you ask them? But you've met them all, so that's that's the, I can't I yeah, can't really ask yeah. you that question. But um, um, but that's all good. I think that's that's wonderful. Tell me something. What was the difference between those world class leaders versus those hidden champions? Was there anything that was different about everyone, or was there something that they all had in common, but there was a little bit of difference because of of stature and things like that? I don't know how to call it. Yeah, I I, I think. It's difficult to describe. And if you ask me, why did they impress you so much? Uh, I, hmm. I cannot articulate that. But I think the true difference is in the, in the core. Uh, many, many uh, so-called leaders play a role. These leaders who impressed me, they did not play a role. They were what they what they did say they, they they walked the talk they were genuine i think this core is yeah is the core of of true leadership so it's, uh, that's uh, for instance expressed in the in the unity of person and purpose as uh, a total identification with with what they do and and that uh, that creates um vis-a-vis -vis the employees or vis-a-vis -vis other people, uh, uh, huge credibility. Uh, they, they don't talk much, but they convince through what they are. For instance, I, I had invited the Cardinal uh, of Cologne, which I mentioned, a big conference, which we did in the 80s on, on uh, business and the church. And so he said he had four doctoral degrees, own doctoral degrees in, in theology, in philosophy, in, uh, in, in law, and in economics. So he said, no, I don't do it. And it was totally clear for me that there was no discussion. But then he recommended a cardinal from the Vatican, who was also an expert who, who gave the speech at this conference. This, like, uh, they say something, it, it, and it's solid, it's like a rock. Uh, Strange experiences. Wow. Fantastic. I was going to say to you before, I think a lot of it is that they're very influential people, but also they become the leader rather than playing the role of the leader, as you were saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Wonderful. Now, tell me, the, the, the title of the show is called Leadership is Changing. When I say that title or that statement, what does that mean for you? It's uh, ambivalent. I would say... Both statements are right. Leadership is not changing and leadership is changing. 
Leadership is not changing in the in the fundamentals. The fundamentals which I learned in the three stages I described and which I describe in, in a lot of detail in my autobiography, Many Worlds, One Life, A Journey from Farmhouse to Global Stage, these fundamentals do not change. Also, the, the aspect, the traits I described with these exemplary leaders. But the concrete content uh, and the tools of leadership change, of course. Uh, when we talk about the, the, the values of, of employees today, they are much more related to purpose, to uh, social aspects, to environmental aspects uh, than these values were uh, 20, 30 years ago. And of course, as a leader, you have to respond to these changes and you also have to use the tools. Uh, the internet digitalization makes things possible, which haven't been possible. I, I introduced, for instance, that was in the late 90s, a, a weekly newsletter, letter, practically everybody does that today, where I was able to address all employees every Friday at nine o'clock European time. So the people in Japan and in San Francisco could read it within normal office times. These are new tools which you can use. Uh, you can talk to people who are remote by, uh, by virtual uh, software, etc. So the fundamentals of leadership haven't changed since Caesar's time 2,000 years ago. The concrete values and the tools are adjusting and you have uh, to go along with that as a leader. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love how you're saying it as well. Because it is the values and it is the the tools that are changing, and um, so what's really interesting here is that you're you're right. I mean, there's a lot of leaders who are sort of being left behind. Why? Because if they're not changing quick enough along those tools and so forth that you're talking about, then they will get left behind and they become irrelevant. Yeah. So the important yeah. thing is you just can't sit on the foundations today. The foundations is the foundations. What we do with those foundations and how we apply it is what's really important for everybody. Yeah, today, yeah. To move forward. yeah, that's good. Good points. Um, now, <laughs> we're talking about the tools. We're talking about the digital side. What's quite interesting here, Herman, is that data, social, technology, science, business is getting faster and faster all the time. And we're living in a very fast paced, ever changing world. In addition to the foundations, in addition to talking about the tools and so forth, is there anything else that you think makes a leader successful in today's fast paced, ever changing world? Yes, I again have a twofold answer. You're right, the world is changing very quickly. And of course, the leader has to adjust to that. We have this buzzword agility, etc. But in the same time, the leader has to main, remain distant, detached, and occasionally step back not to be overwhelmed by the daily news and, and information, but think deeply about what does it mean. If you think, for instance, of the role of an investor, uh, that is a, there is a fashion company of today where the stock price is going up, but you have to stand back and think what is the long-term uh, development? What are the consequences? And let me give you a concrete example. Currently in Europe, uh, everybody is, is deeply concerned about the situation in Ukraine, uh, the problems with Russia. But I think we have to go a step further. Russia will be our neighbor even after the war. And we have to find a way of how to deal with Russia. Right now, we are applying uh, something similar to the Morgenthau plan. The Morgenthau plan was a plan after the Second World War developed by the Treasury Secretary in the US, Morgenthau, to make Germany a rural country, to destroy the industry, etc. And the alternative was a Marshall plan, which was actually implemented, which helped Germany to rebuild its industry, etc. And I think we, we, we must think after the war for Russia, we must develop a, a Marshall plan for them. So yes, short-term reactions are absolute understanding information is, is absolute necessary, what we do today to help Ukraine or to sanction Russia. But in addition, 
we must not lose a long-term view and uh, consider the longer-term consequences. That is leadership, this contradiction of short-term and long-term. Yeah. And Herman, I think what you're saying as well is that there tends to be a lot of noise out there. And if the leaders actually just step back and stop and think, because I don't think that a lot of leaders are doing that enough uh, from what I'm seeing. And I'm not sure whether you're seeing that as well. I think if they take time to stop, step back and think, then they can be more strategic. Then they can decide where they're wanting to go. Are you seeing that or do they need to do this more? Yes, uh, that's right. But you should not underestimate the pressure under which uh, leaders stand from day to day. So it really requires self-discipline to to step back and uh, close the door in order to be able to think. Yeah, very much so. And I noticed a leader the other day, their phone was ringing. We're in a meeting and I could see that they were looking at the phone and they wanted to take it. Yeah, then they yeah, realized then yeah. they realized there was this invention out there called voicemail. And um, yeah. they could see who it was and they just let it go. But it was easy for them just to pick it up and do it there and there in the spot. But um, yeah, it's interesting. There is a lot of pressure on a lot of leaders today. And as we're getting faster as well, there's that pressure. But also there is a microscope on leaders and leadership and seeing what they do and how they perform uh, in their daily lives as well. Now, Herman, you and I have been talking about leadership from the lens of a leader. If I was to say, let's swap lenses and look, think, talk about the employee side of things, how has employees' expectations of leaders changed? I'm really surprised about the changes uh, in the last two years, also induced, I think, by, by Corona, by COVID-19. Uh, soft values like purpose, meaning of work uh, have come to the foreground. Uh, we have now in our company uh, officers for integration, for uh, culture, for diversity, or what we call ESG, environmental social governance, um, has really gained so much in importance. Uh, I, I think that is uh, to a large degree of the uh, consequence of COVID-19, people working partially at home in the home office, thinking more about the meaning of, of their work, of uh, work-life balance. So these values have gained so much in importance. And as a leader, you have to respond to these changed needs of your employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's changed a lot, of course, in the last two years. Yeah. And yeah. On the other hand, I, I would mention that leaders must not neglect the economic aspect of the business. Uh, Companies must remain, private companies must remain profit-oriented. I, I, I just published a book, True uh, Profit, no company ever uh, went down from turning a profit. So I, I see a little danger with some leaders that they neglect this because uh, profit is a cost of survival. What, what do you think is that, what's causing them to neglect it? Uh, the speed of change is neglected, especially with regard to digitalization. Mm. That's currently short-term the most neglected aspect. Mm. Do, you, do you think that there's so much happening, there's so many other things out there, pressures, and that their eye has been taken off, that focus has been taken off the profit and looking elsewhere? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's partially true. Uh, another um, aspect which I see is as, as under estimated as underperceived is China, uh, not in a, in a political sense, in a political sense too, but uh, when you look at the innovation in China, uh, for instance, in, in areas like artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., China will be a very, very serious competitor, and we have to deal with that, and especially since you cannot travel to China, uh, the, the world is currently separated due to COVID-19, we are not close uh, to the game. They are not close enough to the game. What is going on there? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, good, good points. Now, um, Herman, I've got one more question for you here, and that is uh, I'll get you to get your crystal ball out as I say it to our, the people I interview. Where do you see leadership being in five years? Again, I, I say the fundamentals do not change. Uh, what artificial intelligence uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, uh, 
quantum computing will bring for leadership, we still do not know. But I think that the world will again dramatically change in the next five to 10 years. Uh, we, we, we are in, in many areas, also energy included. I, I just uh, they got from a patent attorney uh, an innovation on, on, uh, for, for heating purposes, a uh, totally new system uh, based on, on quantum theory, which will be three times more efficient than heat pumps. And uh, we, we will face a, a tsunami of innovations in the five to 10 years because the pressure is so high in, from the environment, from the energy, etc. And of course, leadership has to cope with that, to understand it, to, to find the right business models uh, so it will be a turbulent and, and very demanding time for leaders uh, to come. Well, it's going to be an interesting time for a lot of leaders to, to think yes, about yes. Uh, that for the, uh, over the five years. Now, Herman, I'm going to just bring things to a close, and I don't know whether, um, but I want to say thank you for joining us on today's show. Now, if our listeners are wanting to get a hold of you, where should they go? Very simple. My page is hermansimon.com. Herman with one R, two N, Simon in one word, dot com. Excellent. We're going to put that into the show notes. Herman, once again, thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Is there a motto that you might want to share with our listeners? I have one life motto, which is from the Roman philosopher Seneca in Latin, per aspera ad astra, which means on rough roads to the stars. You have to strive for the stars, but don't expect it will be an easy journey. The roads will be rough, but never lose the stars out of your sight. Per aspera ad astra. Awesome. What a way to end. So, Herman, thank you once again. There you go, listeners, on Rough Rose to the Stars. Hey, listeners, what we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown and unfamiliar territory. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Look out for the episodes as they're being released. Download them, have a listen, put a review and a rating. Feel free to share them with your friends, your family, and your network. Hey, if there's any feedback you'd like to give me about the show, or if there's a question you have for the Ask Dennis Freestyle episode, then send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. Hey, listeners, it's always a pleasure being with you. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 